it won't be until the very last slide before I uh, say anything uh, of uh, particular relevance to the, the declaration. Uh, I um, rather are going to talk about uh, three, just going back, uh, three species here, some Rimu, some Tuangi, and some Kiriru, and only at the end will I try to bring them back together uh, in direct reference to the day's kaupapa. And, uh, you know, if I'm going to talk about that kaupapa, uh, that's always going to be conditioned by thoughts of home, especially because during the last year I've been toggling between Auckland and uh, Dunedin uh, to cheer our land and corporations back down that way. And, uh, you know, they went through their own history, compulsory acquisition to become scenic reserves in the early 1900s, uh, the unintended taking of about an 800-yard corridor right through the middle of our farms uh, for the main trunk railway uh, when only 50 yards was legal. Uh, these things forced me to see legal protections for resource rights, the declaration, treaty sediment process in particular ways. And despite the lasting impact of these matters, it's that uh, my hometown of Putakanui was supposed to be so much bigger uh, than it is, is the most relevant point. So, you know, land loss in the South Island was different than in the North, uh, with these very large crown purchases, somewhat different again than the North Island. Uh, Māori had negotiated large reserves to live upon down that way. Uh, most of those were dependent on the Crown gazetting them, uh, but very few were actually ever established. After some government commissions that looked at this sort of thing later on, the South Island Landless Natives Act was passed in 1906 to provide some sort of equivalence for the reserves that were intended uh, but were never gazetted. Uh, the location of the Silna blocks, though, made development of them somewhat difficult. And whereas everybody else in the South Island cleared their land of, of native forest, uh, it was left on Silna lands. There's about 57,000 hectares of Silna lands in the South Island, and about 75% of them have uh, native forest on them. In recognition of their history, when the Forest Act was amended in 1993, uh, with the intention of prohibiting forest clearance on private land, when it's native forest, the Silna blocks were actually first uh, exempted from that. Although uh, Rohi is further north from Dunedin, uh, the Silna blocks that we were given are actually in the Catlins district, some 100 kilometres away. It's some of the only Rimu and beach forest that's on the eastern seaboard down in the South Island, and not something that environmental lobbies uh, want to see removed. Because of uh, protests from environmentalists, it's always been politically infeasible to develop these sooner lands to their maximum economic potential. For a long time, the strategy of our incorporation was to antagonise tourists as much as we possibly could, uh, because they wanted to cross our lands to get to the cathedral caves and other scenic wonders, in the hope that that would somehow antagonise the government uh, so that compensation could be compensation. Uh, we were never actually keen to sort of... Uh, uh, cut these forests down, uh, but sometimes the threat of possible harm is the only thing available to ensure that legal rights become actual rights. Other Silna landowners started to receive monetary compensation for their failed land compensation during the 1990s, but the money ran out um, long before the government got round to us. When I started as Incorporation Chair this time last year, uh, we had been waiting for financial compensation for over 20 years. And I, I lasted about three days, gave up pretty, pretty quickly, and at a meeting of the owners, uh, managed to negotiate a, a different path. We would stop bothering about compensation. Uh, our forests are now in a Whenua Rahui covenant with a, a lease arrangement there. We have a carbon credit lease with the German Carbon Sink Network. And we've worked with an international honey producer uh, to put beehives in there. Indigenous environmental rights and the law have always been on our side, technically, but they've never actually helped us. So we see our future in negotiating agreements with various third parties. Uh, because illegal activity is my subject matter from this point on, I don't want to say too much about the who or the where in the next two stories. 
Uh, Reese probably knows where one of them is, but that's giving too much away already. Uh, <laughs> they are about people who make sure that their actions are publicly visible, uh, but I still don't feel right about the ethics of drawing attention to their somewhat illegal practices. So there'll be some weird anonymizing in the rest of this uh, talk. I'm going to review the outcomes of two cases of illegal management or harvesting of native species by Māori, and I indicate how tolerance of those activities has, has, has emerged, and how that has somehow replaced formal state administration with uh, acknowledged de facto rights and informal control. Uh, I got involved in the Tuangi dispute when uh, representing a kaumatua in an out-of-court arbitration. Uh, I'm an academic these days, but still dabble in law occasionally. Uh, unknowingly, he had been contravening regional plan and fisheries rules for several decades. Uh, the determination to maintain his practices reflects the importance of shell fisheries for his uh, whanau and hapu. Uh, his sin was to care for cockle beds that had sustained his community for centuries. Uh, today, it's legal to harvest them, and they're quite generous uh, limits on uh, that for personal use. But encouraging their growth and abundance through active management uh, may in some ways contravene the law. A Eurocentric emphasis on sort of preservationism understands nature as something that's best left untouched. But the elder understood that turning over and thinning shellfish uh, was an essential obligation that promote healthy growth dynamics. Within reason, uh, the more you turn them, the bigger and more abundantly they grow. And as Nephew sort of explains uh, the problem with the law here, I authorise snapper for feasts under the Kaimawana regulations, I harvest cockles under the recreational regulations, if we get a customary rights order, we might use the RMA to protect them against coastal earthworks and such, but under what authority can I turn over pippy or thin oysters? We can manage them Pākehā style, but managing them under tikanga Māori is like animal husbandry. Where's the authority for that? Um, disturbance to promote growth is not accepted as a legitimate form of stock management. But for this to be living customary management, it has to be more than just uh, conservation. Rural depopulation of the elders' rohi meant that disturbance upon which healthy shell fisheries are dependent had reduced over time. It's a new technology and some ingenuity provided uh, useful substitutes for them. The Kamatua purchased and modified a petrol-driven rotary tiller that is marketed for domestic gardeners, and his modifications were quite cunning. He reduced its speed and increased its torque so that he could turn over the shellfish beds without breaking them up. And having repurposed the technology for the next 30 years, he walked onto the sand flats at each low tide and turned over about a rugby field's worth uh, most days, returning to each site uh, about twice a year. Since 1995, such activities contravened regional uh, plan rules that require a resource consent for disturbing or removing more than a cubic metre of sand. Now, those rules were never intended to you know, regulate harvesting or management of shellfish. Uh, they were established to control commercial sand extraction and the dispersal of sediment, but they also have impacted upon <coughs> customary fisheries. Uh, discovery by regional monitoring staff led to a formal notice of abatement for him, which he willfully ignored and just kept on doing what he was doing. Yet the prospect of public empathy towards the case of an 82-year-old who might be thrown before the courts encouraged local authorities to pursue an out-of-court mediation. And at all stages, the elder presented a really convincing argument. Shellfish had sustained his people for centuries, and he was therefore obliged to tend the beds. After all, his disturbance regime was clearly benefiting uh, a species of cultural importance. Although refusing to commit to any change in his daily ritual, he was cautioned but not fined. Uh, he returned to his work the very next day, but now with an audience of media representatives and state <coughs> environmental monitors. Each new round of arbitration attracts uh, new monitoring and additional reporters, <coughs> but both local and central government has no resolve to prosecute him rendering its regulations ineffectual, ineffectual in, in other ways too. 
Uh, he's now joined by six others who have purchased and modified their own rotary accelerators for similar acts of tolerated but essentially illegal work. Third narrative, some well-controlled uh, but illegal harvesting of kiru. In times past, of course, Māori developed some cunning and complex management, harvesting and trading practices for kiru. However, customary harvest of native birds was effectively uh, illegalised and criminalised uh, back in 1912. And that uh, posed a big problem for the uh, elders of a landlocked forest in the North Island uh, because the prohibitions presented a dilemma for them. They were otherwise landlocked and uh, yeah, had no other real reliable source of protein. That was their major source of protein before that time. Uh, the dilemma for local Māori shifted over time. Bird populations continued to decline because invasive species and loss of habitat uh, were more consequential than any harvesting. Yet, non-Māori assumptions that Māori regularly poached uh, native avifauna had impacted on their public reputation and to some extent their authority. By the present day, reverence for the birds that had once sustained them as food pushed the tribe into taking a leadership role in habitat restoration. But state and ENGO uh, campaigns ignored the conservation work and focused again on the assumption of poaching. I write a few uh, environmental histories for the tribe to service their treaty claims, uh, but this entire history of birding was sort of like off limits to the treaty settlement process, something that you know, couldn't be talked about. And uh, don't want to go into the detail here, but you can see from the language used that opposition to Māori harvesting continues to be part of a, a civilising mission uh, against them. I think my favourite there has to be uh, this one here, you know, Māori youth trade illegal kereru for illegal drugs, which is sort of like bringing together all of our favourite stereotypes about Māori criminality into, into one place. It's brilliant. Uh, local elders proposed a bold but illegal solution. They would recommence harvests of kereru, uh, but only to provide the last meal for elders before their departure to other realms. Uh, Doc comprehended the secondary intent uh, to regulate the actions of non-local Māori, who were usually responsible for any poaching. Uh, it also noted, however, that re-establishment of harvests here contravened many of its standard operating procedures and several acts of Parliament too. While they refused to sanction officially any harvest, they agreed to turn a post-colonial blind eye uh, to the work of the elders. And since that time, only six birds have been harvested to become the last meals of the almost departed. More significantly, perhaps, non-Māori organisations, these are relationships again, have intensified their efforts to control uh, invasive species within local forests. Uh, there's the sudden upward trend in kereru numbers that Wellington has noted, but which it can't quite explain, uh, because no one can actually tell them why kereru are expanding in number in these forests. And the compromise has other benefits to it. Straight after handshakes on the agreement, the area manager of DOC had a restless night with nightmares about the consequences of the deal. And he awoke, however, with a real sense of clarity. Although Pākehā, he had long been married to a local uh, woman, tribal woman, and he thought that the compromise was something like his marriage. And then he had a revelation. You know, management of his conservation area could be run on marriage principles. From that day, there has been an open door on all decision-making, uh, meetings and daily practices um, you know, run on marriage principles, as he calls it. And if anything goes wrong, well, they get in a marriage guidance counsellor, of course. That's how it's supposed to run. Uh, from a few quiet but illegal acts, a range of experiments with sort of informal collaboration have emerged. The big advantage in the marriage principles is that they're familiar, culturally understood and informal. Their informal rules, just as Marai operate on known but informal rules. Formal rules and rights exclude because you need some kamatawa to sign up for them, then sign off on every little decision. That divides us. Day after day, marriages work with no written rules. Marriages are about give and take. So he chooses to ignore the kiruru take, 
and we give back through pest control. So moving towards a conclusion, first, I think all tribes that I've discussed today have gone through the treaty settlement process and come out the other side of it. In addition, they've gone through extensive court processes to clarify their resource rights. Yet I'm not sure that anything they've got from those formal pathways exceeds uh, what they've achieved by the informal, everyday politics of just doing their thing. The treaty seemed to promise a relationship that looks a little bit like marriage. Uh, what does it suggest when tribes need to go outside of the formal rights-making processes to manufacture some sort of marital accord? Second, uh, the degree of compromise and the durability in the de facto norms that I've sort of summarised as being management is, is quite significant. Acceptance of Rotary Ho provides for active management, and I think that's going to be better uh, given the non-equilibrium ecologies that we now see in New Zealand. Leaving resources untouched is basically just leaving them to the possums. doesn't make much sense. Uh, state conservation practices are so challenged in some parts of New Zealand that they're not being fully implemented. Reconfiguration of the Kiruru management to meet cultural needs, albeit illegal, albeit invisible and clandestine, is also less contested and more locally legitimate and arguably sustainable too. Uh, my stories, I guess, have been stories where law, policy, some other formal mechanism has authorised indigenous practices, but where the formal authorisation made no difference whatsoever. Or there have been stories where indigenous practices, negotiated agreements or clandestine activities have no formal nor legal support, but function quite adequately, even in very difficult conditions. What does that say about formal rights-making processes and whether the declaration will progress them in more appropriate ways? Uh, according to my good friends Tayaki Alfred and Jeff uh, Corntassel from the Indigenous Governance Program at the University of Victoria in Canada, when we believe that we get our rights from the state, the courts are from international statements of intent, we've already lost. And I think they make a very powerful point there. The declaration is support for Māori and other indigenous peoples to be Māori. A cultural right to be different. I wasn't quite aware that I needed a cultural right to be different. I've always been different. Uh, a very good author, Brianna Banda from Canada, has recently said that it's a right to be. Uh, it's a particular type of citizenship right that is tied uh, to non-indigenous liberal precepts of citizenship. Part of that is, in her words, a right to be an environmentalist. And that's her characterisation of the environmental clauses in the UNDRIP. And, uh, you know, I, I would have thought from the first narrative that I provided that I don't really find much um, need to be an environmentalist as an Indigenous person. In the work I do with Māori communities, I'll probably continue to recommend that they place their efforts elsewhere. You know, there's more to be gained from the mundane practices of the informal and the everyday uh, than there is sometimes from formal sediment processes. Thank you. Any challenges there? Any comments? Um, I'm interested in, in your approach to informal agreements and what you were talking about. Um, was it marriage principles? I'm really interested in that, I, but I do not fully understand it. Do you mean more in an anarchical way that we should regulate ourselves? Um, I mean, not a top to bottom, but just equal to equal? Or can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I mean, for that particular group, uh, they had gone through a very long process of negotiating all sorts of rights for a neighbouring place within the conservation estate, still trying to keep it anonymous. And, you know, they, they'd spent a long time doing it, and relationships had really broken down internally and, and externally. And I think why they found the marriage principles to be so refreshing is that a good marriage is based on respect, and they'd completely lost respect for the state. They'd lost respect for themselves and having to fight dirty to get what they wanted through legal processes. So, yeah, I and mean, I, think, I think that's, that's the key difference. Um, 
rather than trying to base our rights in legalized processes, trying to base them in legalized respect. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, least legalized forms of respect seems to be their thinking on it anyway. And um, all, all I can really say, I'm, I'm an outsider from the process, it's probably not for me to say whether it's working or not, but it's amazing how many other big problems have been solved there since that time, including how to do with um, you know, a large number of invasive species that uh, you know, clearly pest control hasn't always been something that, that, that Māori have um, agreed with. Uh, and yet those very big dilemmas have been dealt with. Um, other dilemmas about uh, you know, how, to, um, how to start dealing with drug and alcohol problems have actually come out of the, the, the marriage principles. I'm not saying that it's, uh, it's perfect. And in fact, you know, at a recent meeting I, I sat in on, you know, someone said, well, you know, we, we better, if we're going to talk about these marriage principles, perhaps we should talk about the rate of divorce within Māori families in New Zealand. And, you know, I, I started breaking down into a conversation about should we be divorcing the state now and that sort of thing. But it, 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 all I'd say is that it's, it's progressed a long way, whereas the formal process just led to more. If the issues in, for example, the Waitangi Tribunal could be addressed in this, like, taking this approach? Um, I want to, want to try to say something positive. Uh, yeah, Nick Reese and I do know each other and we sort of agreed to be um, good cop and bad cop but for this, but um, I, I think there's a difficulty in the treaty settlement process at the moment that although it was a really good thing from 1985 uh, to go retrospective, uh, the problem is that land has become such a focus and land development rights become such a focus that a lot of other things get left off. And it's not a well-rounded process at the moment. It's so focused on repatriation of land uh, that a lot of the potential good gets, gets left behind, in my opinion. You know, for that, that particular tribe with the marriage principles, you know, I wrote a, a series of environmental reports. There was a social report. And then there were 37 reports about land loss and, and, and that sort of thing. You know, imagine all the other issues that are left out because of the preoccupation with land. I still think it's a good process, but it's just too preoccupied with, with that one thing. Yeah, just, um, that's great. And, um, both today have similar amounts of, if you like, um, equity. One through real estate portfolio, the other through you can have a relationship like the ones that you've been describing with the land that the people have kept warm for the last millennia. Soulfully, they still get to the same place. Hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I guess, you know, when I've talked about this sort of thing before, I, I feel like it's been sort of misplaced slightly, and, and it, uh, I'm not saying that the informal should replace the formal. You know, the formal is very important for some tribes. It's just that um, it has a particular type of politics to it, and it doesn't always suit the needs of communities. And... Uh, you know, what else can we do beyond a treaty settlement process? And looking at it another way, I think often part of the problem with the treaty settlements that I've been involved with is that once they're done, they're sort of done. The full and final thing becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. And, you know, where's the capacity building to actually make the settlement work once that, that process is, is done for? So, yeah, different, different pathways, the same result, completely agree. But I, I still think that one of the pathways has to be a less legalised one, um, if, we, if we're really going to get the most out of it. And that could be seen as a, a fresh way of defining self-determination, to use the language of the Declaration, couldn't it? You know, mm. Taking the law into your own hands, or taking responsibility into your own hands. I'm not advocating yeah. illegal behaviour. No. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, you mentioned um, issues regarding peace control, and um, well, yeah, I mean, there's so much that could be said there. I mean, in that particular place with the marriage principles, uh, you know, there had been some huge fights. Um, helicopters that were, uh, had their petrol replaced, or fuel replaced with sand and all the rest of it um, to prevent 1080 drops. Uh, it's interesting now, post the marriage principles, that they've found a local solution, and it is just dealing with traps. You know, it's not it's not the cheapest me mechanism, 
but uh, you know they've managed to find a mechanism that have got the pests down to an acceptable level, and you know Doc is celebrating the project is working, uh, Tangata to Fenora is celebrating the project is working, but it costs five dollars a hectare more. <laughs>